Hi, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Marshall. Welcome to Tumble, the show where we explore stories of science discovery. Today, we're talking about toilets. So you finally found an outlet for all your potty humor desires. <laughs> um, it wasn't hard to find. <laughs> <laughs> and it's all in the name of potty science and engineering, because we'll be plunging into the past, present, and future of flushing to discover how toilets don't just save us from stinky smells, they save lives. Today's question comes from our listener, Ellie. Hi, my name is Ellie. I'm nine years old and I'm from the Philippines. My question is, how do toilets work? I just know you push a button and everything goes somewhere else, which is not here. And that's all I really need to know. But where does it go, Marshall? What happened? I don't know. Just out of the house. That's all I care about. Out of the house. Well, I think our listeners are a bit more curious than you. So let's ask them. How do you think that toilets work? And how do you think that they were invented? Because we'll be back with a toilet expert who will guide us to the answer right after this. Francis de los Reyes is an engineer who's tackling the world's toilet troubles, which makes him the perfect person to help us answer Ellie's question. Like Ellie, he grew up in the Philippines and he spent a lot of time with toilets there. You could lock the door and be there for, you know, a long time and just read and, and enjoy. Yeah, I got to say, I have some strong sympathies with that behavior. <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> um, it's like the one place you can just be by yourself and no one will bother you. When Francis started studying the engineering round toilets, he got even more interested in these porcelain thrones. Later on, it became kind of like an obsession almost. Like I have a collection of pictures of toilets from all over the world. Francis told me his favorite toilet is in a high tower in Shanghai, where you can enjoy an exquisite view of the city through floor to ceiling windows. But no matter where a flush toilet is, they mostly work the same. There is a source of water. It's called the water closet or, you know, that tank that sits behind the toilet. And when you flush, all that water comes out through holes around the side. And it's designed to also clean the inside of the toilet as it's going down. Okay, and then the water like somehow takes the stuff down a tube. And what, what about the tube? Ah, uh, yes. The toilet tube begins a beautiful journey through a modern engineering marvel. And so if you look to the side, the pipe curves like an S up and then around and then down. That curve is called the S-trap, and it's a pivotal piece of toilet technology. What that does is you get this siphon effect, which means that the water, as it's flushed, are pushed down this tube, not in a straight line, but in a curve. This siphon effect brings the water up above the water level of the toilet, helping the water flow down smoothly without a pump. And that curve creates this almost vacuum effect. And so when you flush, you're, you're going to hear this sucking sound almost like when you flush. So the, the S-trap is what makes the trademark flush sound? Is that the only reason it's a big deal? Because we need the sound to feel like we're accomplishing something? <laughs> it's also an important sound effect that tells you that somebody has been in the house the whole time. <laughs> More importantly, the S-trap captures some clean water in the pipe. So the water seal or the water plug at the top of the bowl actually prevents that gas from coming back up. And that's because of the S-trap, that curvature in the pipe underneath the toilet. Okay, so that creates the seal that keeps the smells and all those nasty sewer gases out of your bathroom. So I really can't imagine what a bathroom would be without that. Well, let's imagine. Through toilet history is a history that comes with a lot of unwelcome odors. And it's the story of the people who tried to get rid of the stink. Even in humans' most important early writings, people were concerned about where to go to the bathroom. Both in the Quran and in the Bible and other religious texts, where they basically say, uh, do your dirty business away from camp. 
Yeah, that seems like something all religions can agree on. <laughs> there is just something instinctive about depositing our waste somewhere away from where we live. And at first, doing that was simple. They would just go out and dig a hole and cover it up, away from camp, away from where the houses are. But when people started living closer together in cities, it wasn't so easy to dig a new hole for each bathroom break. Ancient civilizations started to build a system of open drains with flowing water, like a water slide for waste, carrying it away from people's homes. And even in the early Roman times, people used water to move wastes away. So these were like early sewers? Yes, and archaeological excavations in Rome have revealed ancient toilets, benches with holes in them. You still can see today these rows of toilets that are pretty much toilet houses. And, and, and going to the toilet in the morning was a communal activity. Yeah, I've actually been to these in Rome where you see all the toilet holes kind of lined up around the edge of a wall and you wonder what people were doing in there. <laughs> And they basically sat together and they would exchange the news and make business deals and so on. That's probably why they call going to the bathroom doing your business. <laughs> it probably would have smelled pretty bad, would be my guess. It's basically just an outhouse in the middle of the city. Uh, it sounds awful. And okay, I know this isn't about the toilets themselves, but I also feel compelled to share what Romans used for wiping. Go ahead. It was a sponge on a stick. And that was kind of... You know, the communal stick. Hopefully they washed it off between uses. <laughs> they did. There was a little canal that ran in front of the toilet bench and they just dipped it in the water and then washed away. Oh, boy. <laughs> so, like, a bunch of stuff happened and now we're talking about modern toilets, right? <laughs> <laughs> sure we are. So the best in toilet technology has always been reserved for the wealthy. And the first flush toilet as we know it was no exception. Now, the modern toilet, as you know it, the flush toilet, was invented by somebody named Harrington. John Harrington was in Queen Elizabeth I's royal court around the 1600s. He wasn't really known as an inventor, but something compelled him to make a toilet for the queen. I mean, I guess that's definitely one way to impress a queen. <laughs> like, here's a better place to poop, your grace. So Harrington tinkered to make a toilet that had a tank high above the throne with a pull for a flusher, the royal flush. There's a long pipe going down and that provided the potential energy for the flush. But at that time, there still was no S-trap. So it was still uh, quite smelly. So the queen was just like, thanks, but no thanks. I'll keep things as they are. Yeah, according to the stories, the toilet wasn't a smashing success. So it wasn't whooshing across the nation? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't until 1775 when a former watchmaker named Alexander Cumming invented the S-trap that toilets finally got it right. Stink no more. Not so fast. The stink was still in the air because where waste went hadn't changed much since those early open sewers. Basically, the wastes were moved by water away from individual houses to a centralized storage, maybe a lagoon. A lagoon of poop? That seems unfortunate. It's definitely not the kind of lagoon that you see in The Little Mermaid, where Ariel and Prince Eric have their first kiss, which was my understanding of what a lagoon is. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> what if it was that? <laughs> oh. <laughs> the modern sewer system, as we know it, was actually, if you will, invented in the 1800s in London. The summer of 1858 in London was known as the Great Stink. Oh God, that sounds like a summer you don't want to be hanging out in. So London had this system of open sewers and lagoons, and it all eventually flowed into the River Thames. The river goes right past the House of Parliament, where the people who ran the government would smell it, or try their best to avoid smelling it. They would order the windows closed so that they won't be able to smell it. They put chloroform and other chemicals on heavy curtains so that they won't be able to smell it. But then at the end of the day, they were like, we got to do something about this. They're all like, we can't think with this great stink. 
At the same time, the evidence was piling up that this wasn't just a smell issue. Where was it piling? (laughs) A scientist named Jon Snow proved that germs from the waste were getting into the city's drinking water and causing deadly disease. Wait, so people didn't know that waste plus water equals disease? No, they thought that the bad smell itself could cause the disease. So it all came together when the government finally stopped pinching their noses long enough to hire an engineer named Joseph Bazalgette to fix the problem. So what he did was he built miles and miles of sewer lines. All right, so finally we're uh, getting rid of the poop lagoons. (laughs) Bazalgette's sewer system ended the Great Stink and saved many, many lives from disease. But it was missing one important part— A way to treat the waste. To treat the waste? Like give it a free gift and stuff? (laughs) To treat waste means to clean it. Because without cleaning waste, you're just moving it somewhere else and making it someone else's problem, which is bad for human health and the environment. So how do you clean waste? At the wastewater treatment plant, we do a combination of things. A wastewater treatment plant is a modern engineering marvel. It's like a car wash for the waste. There's different stages. First, the sewage goes through filters to catch solid garbage that might end up there. But the main thing that we do at the wastewater treatment plant is we have these biological reactors that have billions and billions of microorganisms that actually eat the waste. Wait, they they eat the waste? Yeah, the bacteria are like, what a treat to treat this water. Oh, that's cute. (laughs) (laughs) So the bacteria eat the poop and convert it into gas. Then the remaining liquids are filtered and disinfected over and over again until only water is left. So now this water, which is quite clean now, can actually now join a river or a stream or a lake. Really? So it's, it's that clean that you can just send it out again? If everything goes right. And, you know, I think one of the most interesting things about this whole story is that we like privacy to use the toilet. But the system that really makes the toilet work involves the entire community. Toilets connect us all through our pipes. But wait, that's not all. Now that we've got the basic function, toilets can get fancier features. There's other cool things happening in toilets, too. Let's see, you've got ultra-low flush toilets that can serve water, toilets that can track your health, toilets with a bidet to wash your butt, and a built-in butt dryer. That all sounds like a bit extra to me. I'm personally just happy that we have clean toilet situations and no poop lagoons. Well, actually, almost half of humans still don't have access to basic sanitation, that system that keeps us healthy. And that's what Francis is working on. About three and a half billion people, so, you know, a little bit less than half of the people in the world don't have what we call properly managed or safely managed sanitation services. Wait, so you're telling me that nearly half the people in the world don't even have a toilet? Well, it's not just about a toilet. They may have a toilet, but their ways are not properly treated. So many people are stuck in the era of the Great Stink. Their waste just lingers nearby, maybe in a pit toilet, which is like a big communal outhouse. And for a portion of those people, maybe they just do something called open defecation, which is basically they go out and they do their business behind bushes or near riverbanks. So that's like they're back in the time before toilets or BT. We have all kinds of high tech. Systems And yet to think about almost half the people in the world, their wastes are not safely managed. That's a little bit crazy, right? I mean, it's kind of like, what's going on in here? For Francis, the biggest challenge in the future of toilets is getting sanitation to everyone on the planet. And he said it's not a one-toilet-fits-all situation. Maybe the best solution for some of these countries is not to have the same system that we have here in the U.S. What does he mean by that? Well, it's very expensive to build and maintain all the pipes and wastewater treatment plants through a big town or city. But fortunately, engineers are figuring out other ways to flush and treat our waste that actually turn waste into a valuable resource. Eventually, hopefully, we will have a toilet that does it all. 
essentially you when you flush it it converts our waste into energy and it doesn't smell wait a toilet that does it all and turns waste into energy that's incredible yeah the ingredients of poop and pee are actually essential for farming so we're talking about nitrogen and phosphorus these are important chemicals for plant growth think fertilizers move over manure because the humans are making new fertilizer Uh, But there are other things that can be done. We can convert this to biofuels. We can use poop power? I would love that. I guess. there would never be a problem of where to find it. We do produce a lot of this, right? We do produce the equivalent of 10,000 plus Olympic-sized swimming pools every day in the world in terms of, you know, poop. If we change our perspective and think of this as resources, not as wastes, then maybe the future is a little bit better That sounds like a future that I can get behind for you and for P. (laughs) Sign me up. Now that you know how toilets work, take a look at your own. When you flush it, think about how all the systems work together to create modern sanitation. (laughs) Now think of how you would design a new toilet, either with exciting new features for your family or maybe full systems for people who don't have toilets. Send us your designs to tumblepodcast at gmail.com. Thanks to Dr. Francis de los Reyes, professor of civil and environmental engineering at North Carolina State University. And special thanks to our listener, Ellie, for sending in such a great question. If you'd like to hear more about how Francis is helping solve toilet and sanitation challenges, listen to our bonus interview episode with him. It's available to Patreon members who pledge just $1 a month or more. We'll also have free resources to learn more on the blog on our website, sciencepodcastforkids.com. Plus, did you know we now have transcripts available for all of our episodes? Find that on the blog. Sarah Robertson Lentz edited this episode and created the episode art. Elliot Hijaj is our production assistant. Eric Kuhn is our engineer. I'm Lindsay Patterson, and I wrote this episode. And I'm Marsh Lescamilla, and I made all the music and sound design for this episode. Tumble is a production of Tumble Media. Thanks for listening, and join us next time for more stories of science discovery. 